Hey everyone, I am here to tell you that I've got a video for all of your required documents all in one place. Hope you enjoy. All right, so let's start our flashcards for our core documents for the course. I've actually made a slideshow here so we can go through each of the documents and have a little more space to put a few of the key things you need to know about each one on your flashcard. So on the left here, we have the flashcard. The first document is the Declaration of Independence. This was clearly studied in our first unit on constitutional origins. The key thing you need to know about the Declaration of Independence, in addition to the fact that historically speaking, it simply uh, declared independence of the United States from the British, is the fact that it under, underlies or has some underpinnings to the U.S. political system philosophically. Limited government is the core idea that we need to talk about with regards to the Declaration of Independence. There's three things that we can connect to the idea that the U.S. government is going to be limited. It's not going to have unlimited power. It's not going to be a monarchy. And these ideas are embodied in the Declaration of Independence. First is natural rights. Thomas Jefferson really echoes John Locke when he says that all men are created equal and they have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Locke had said that they had the right to life, liberty, and property. So these are rights that people are born with. And this is something that is going to be at the core of American philosophy towards limitations on government. These natural rights can't be taken away. Second, we have the idea of popular sovereignty. Sovereignty meaning power and popular meaning the people. So power comes from the people themselves in the American political system. And this is a philosophical idea that is embedded in the Declaration of Independence. It says the people have basically the right to govern themselves. And when the, uh, when the government is not holding up its end of the bargain, then the people can overthrow that government. And what is that bargain? Really, it's a social contract, which is another philosophical idea that the people themselves give up some of their natural rights in the state of nature. And uh, in return, they get basic protections from the government so that we don't have anarchy. In the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson's arguing that the king has not held up his end of the bargain, is infringing upon rights and is acting in a way that is uh, opposed to these philosophical beliefs. The Declaration of Independence does not create a government, but it lays a groundwork for the ideological ideas in the government, the philosophical underpinnings of the limited government philosophy in the American political system. Our second document is the Articles of Confederation. You obviously need to know the historical context to the Articles of Confederation, I'm not going to talk all about that here. We'll talk about it in other videos, and we certainly talked about it in the course. What you need to know, first of all, this is in our first unit, constitutional origins, constitutional underpinnings. And you need to understand the structure of government that the article set up, what its key provisions were, and most importantly, what its weaknesses are. Because its weaknesses basically highlight things that are going to end up, for the most part, in the United States Constitution in its final form. So it's key components. It creates a single legislative branch, but there are a lot of things that are not in it, and there are a lot of things that it can't do. So it doesn't have any power to tax directly. It doesn't have any, any permanent judicial branch. It doesn't have any chief executive to enforce the, role, the, the, the law. It doesn't have the power to raise a military. There's no power to regulate interstate commerce. It is extremely difficult to modify. They need a unanimous vote to modify, which is virtually impossible. And it's also extremely difficult to pass any piece of legislation. Nine out of 13 are required to do that. So the Articles of Confederation we talked about in the other videos, and we'll talk about uh, you, you have resources related to it in, in our course of study. It really is not adequate to solve the issues that the, the new country faced. You see the Shays' Rebellion occur. You see a, a crumbling economy occur. And so the Constitutional Convention is called to really address the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. So those are our first two documents. They're really important. If you get asked to use either of these documents in an essay of some sort, or if you get multiple choice questions about it, I think some of these core ideas could really help you understand how to answer those questions. So we'll stop here and continue in the next video. So here we go with our next document. The next document we're required to understand and be able to use 
for our exams are the uh, some of the Federalist Papers so and the Anti-Federalist Papers. We'll start with Federalist 10. Federalist 10 was also studied in our first unit on constitutional origins. And I have some key ideas here on the right that will help us understand what the key components of the document are, how it relates to the concepts of participatory versus pluralist versus elitist democracies, and what factions are and how they play a role in this particular document. So it is a Federalist paper, historically speaking. The Federalist papers were written by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. This one written by James Madison, trying to convince in particular the state of, the New, York, state of New York to ratify the Constitution. And there were a lot of people who were opposed to the Constitution. They thought it was very dangerous and it wouldn't create an effective government. Federalist Papers should try to uh, counteract those arguments. So Madison talks a lot about the idea of factions in Federalist 10. We've read this document, so you want to go back to the text of it itself. But a faction, generally speaking, is a group of people who are aligned for a common purpose. They, in the modern sense, would be an interest group, a group of people who are trying to get a certain policy proposal through our political system. The concern that some people have when it comes to democracy and that people had at the time of the debate over the ratification of the Constitution was that factions were very dangerous in a democratic system and one faction could overrule the rights of minority groups and minority factions could be overwhelmed not all voices would be able to hurt, to be heard and this could lead to tyranny so Madison uh, argues that you can't get rid of factions but you can control factions so that's the key in Federalist 10 is that the mischiefs of factions, the bad things that factions can do, taking away rights from people, they can be controlled by the political system that the Constitution set up. So people will argue that, and Madison argues, that a pure participatory democracy is not, it's not going to work. It doesn't solve factions. So if everybody is voting on everything and political participation is entirely complete, then this doesn't solve the mischiefs of factions. In this case, excuse me, overwhelming majorities of people could uh, you know, impose their, their will on others. So Madison argues for a large republic. This is really, really important. He says, this is at the core of the U.S., our, the Constitution that is, that is created. It actually creates a system where factions will not be able to take complete control. No one single faction, because so many different groups are represented, will be able to overwhelm uh, all of the other factions. The, the country will be big enough that it will prevent that from occurring. So that's one of the things he really, really pushes on, is that we need a large republic. And as it relates to pluralism and elitism, you know, Madison, you could, you could say he kind of argues for elements of both in this particular document. He says that we're going to have a society that is pluralist. We're going to have the best features of a pluralist system. More people, more groups of people are going to be involved in our large republic. Different views are going to be represented from across the country. And this is inherently good, and the best ideas will be brought forward. He also has an element of an elitist uh, argument. He basically is saying that because we have a large republic, we'll be able to choose the best representatives, the smartest people to help govern that republic. And sometimes the elites, they actually know better than the people themselves what's, what's best. And so Madison, he says, we're not going to have a participatory democracy. It doesn't work. But a pluralist democracy could work, and elitist elements of that could also work. Large republic, that's what we want. It eliminates the mischiefs of factions. On the flip side of this, we have Brutus I. So Brutus I is an anti-Federalist paper, or a series of counter-arguments that are made to the Federalist papers during the debates over the ratification of the Constitution. And in this particular paper, you, know, you can kind of go point by point uh, when it comes to what Madison said in Federalist 10 and comparing it to Brutus I. So... Brutus won. The argument is going to be that large republics are they're way too large, they're way too unwieldy, it's way too impractical to govern a country in a democratic republican way that's this big. It just it just can't work. And so there's a real concern about about having a strong centralized republican government for such a wide vast territory. There's concern that this would be way too pluralistic. There would be different groups pushing against one another so much that 
the system would become bogged down and no decisions would be able to be made and it would become very inefficient and ineffective. And there's also a concern that in this ineffective and inefficient system, a elite group could take control or could take advantage of the situation. And then eventually that could lead to a tyrannical government where people are saying, well, the pluralist system isn't working, so we got to follow these few people or this individual who's trying to take charge of the chaos. So, you know, although Brutus, one, doesn't explicitly say we want a participatory democracy, he's implying that smaller governments, more participatory elements, that's going to be a much more effective system. So you see a real contrast between Federalist 10 and Brutus 1. It's really important you understand these documents and understand how they go together or really are flip sides of the same coin when it comes to what the pros and cons were that were being argued after the Constitution was written at the Constitutional Convention and when the states were debating whether or not they should ratify it. So those are our two documents, Federalist 10 and Brutus 1. So continuing on here, one of the key documents that is on our college board list of documents that we must know, foundational documents, is the United States Constitution. It would be silly for me to try to put on a single flashcard everything you need to know about the United States Constitution. Of course, it's integral to every unit we study. So just understand and be aware of the fact that in a document-based question, they might ask you to bring examples in from the Constitution itself. And the core ideas in the Constitution obviously checks and balances and separation of powers and the main com compromises that were made when it comes to representation and the great compromise at the Constitutional Convention. So there's a lot of other flashcards and other topics in our other units on the Constitution itself, and you need to know all the provisions we've talked about. So I'm not going to make a separate flashcard about the Constitution itself. That would just be a, a silly endeavor. So just make sure you know all the things we've talked about related to the Constitution all the way throughout the course. I will, however, dovetail that comment with the Federalist 51 document, which directly relates to the core ideas in the Constitution. So the Federalist 51, again, a Federalist paper arguing for the ratification of the Constitution. It argues and really explains the philosophy behind the two key constitutional concepts, separation of powers and checks and balances. So it's a really, really important document because of all the concepts in the Constitution, these are at, at the core some of the most significant. Of course, separation of powers is the idea that you have three distinct branches that have different jobs. The legislative branch creates laws, the executive branch enforces the law, and the judicial branch interprets the law. N you know, related to this concept is checks and balances. The idea that each branch can limit the other branches through some of their designated powers, be it through a presidential veto of legislation, be it through an a congressional impeachment of a judge or a president, be it through a judicial pardon or judicial interpretation of a law. So these, uh, uh, excuse me, a, a, a judicial uh, interpretation of a law and a presidential pardon uh, of, a, of a crime, con uh, conviction of a crime. So these are at the core of our political system. And I just thought it would be useful uh, to uh, put here uh, some of the key quotes from Federalist 51. So one of the quotes says, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the govern and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. The key idea here being human beings are flawed. And so whoever we have in power in a political system, they will have flaws. They will be imperfect. And you have and you always run a risk in any government of a government becoming tyrannical, of overreaching. This is one of the concerns the Anti-Federalists had. This is a, a fear that Madison is trying to put to rest here, saying if parts of the government are are in the hands of, of bad people who want to do bad things, then the other government governmental components will be able to, to control it, right? The government must control the people, but then be able to control itself. And this is their ne this next quote here. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. You hear politicians say this 
all the time when they're debating, you know, when, when Congress is getting upset about something the president is doing, you'll hear uh, congressmen and women use this quote and say, we must be able to limit the powers of, of the other branches. And, and that's, that's at the core of our political system. Sometimes it functions well, sometimes it doesn't. And that's something we talk about throughout the whole course. You know, we certainly aren't here saying, look how perfect the system is. But, you know, this is something that that uh, is is philosophically at the at the the bedrock of the American political system, and Madison discusses it in Federalist Fifty One. We talk about it in our first unit. I just noticed here, uh, Federalist Seventy. It says it should say Fifty One, but when it says how are concepts of Federalist Fifty One embedded in the Constitution, you want to give examples of checks and balances. You want to be able to give examples of the different powers that each of the three branches have. They're embedded all over the place. They're, they're, they're you know, woven into the fabric of the document. So the Constitution, Federalist 51, documents we need to know. So let's talk about a couple more Federalist papers. Federalist 70 is about the executive branch. And really quickly, we can just talk about how in this paper, Alexander Hamilton He's talking about how we need a strong, vigorous, unitary executive. There were people who were arguing that the executive should have very limited powers and or that the executive power should be in the hands of multiple people, perhaps a council of people. Alexander Hamilton counteracts this argument, and he explains why we should have a powerful, strong, single executive. I think this key quote here is something that is useful. It's very early in the essay. He says, energy in the executive is a leading character in the definition of good government. By energy, he's saying powers, abilities. It is essential to the protection of the community against foreign attacks, something we see presidents in the modern era say is at the key of uh, why they should have extensive presidential power under the Constitution. It is not less essential to the steady administration of the laws to the protection of property against those irregular and high-handed combinations which sometimes interrupted the ordinary course of justice, to the security of liberty against the enterprises and assaults of ambition, of faction, and of anarchy. He's saying everything that we're doing here, or everything that we're, every reason we're trying to create this Constitution will be aided by a strong, single executive. And he goes on to say that this executive really is very preferable to a multi-person executive. There's a concern that a, an executive with a council of some sort, three executive council, five people, they'll be inefficient in their decision making. And decisions sometimes need to be made quickly. So... We see much of Hamilton's arguments here embedded in the Constitution, and have, we exactly have that. We have a single executive. They have important constitutional powers. Uh, most, ex most, uh, most importantly, one would argue, the uh, commander-in-chief of the military, which is wh what their primary function is. It is essential to, of the community against foreign attacks. But he also says they have other, other jobs as well as chief executive. And so... You know, if, if, you're, if you're someone who's a proponent of, of strong executive authority under Article 2, Federalist 70, Federal 70 is where you're going to find your, your, your argument from the founders. I would point out that many people were concerned about a strong executive because of what the nation, the new nation, had gone through with a strong executive in a monarchy with the British. So... That's what the Anti-Federalists are trying to avoid here. But Hamilton says you can't just throw it all away. You still need strong executive authority. There were some who thought we should have a, a, uh, a, an executive for life um, with, uh, with uh, n you know, no removal. But this uh, strong executive that's in the Constitution doesn't have that. So there were compromises that were made from the, real s the, the monarchists who were still out there in the United States. Um, and then we can talk about Federalist 78. So Federalist 70 is the executive. Federalist 78 is the judiciary. People were concerned about having this independent judiciary, this, this strong judicial branch, and Alexander Hamilton's um, trying to put their concerns at ease. He talks about how the judicial branch is the weakest of the three. He actually says that. Uh, he says, here's a quote, the judiciary, on the contrary, has no influence over either the sword or the purse. So the sword would be 
what the president has power over, and the purse is what Congress has power over. So the, the judiciary doesn't have any power over either of those things. So if the judiciary does something wrong, there's really nothing they can do to enforce it, which is one of the key ideas about a check on the judiciary is that they depend on the other branches for enforcement of their decisions. Uh, no direction either the strength either of the strength or of the will of, so, of the society and can take no act of resolution whatever. It may truly be said to have neither force nor will but merely judgment and must ultimately depend upon the aid of the executive arm for the efficacy, the effectiveness of its judgment. He also talks about how, so if we're going to have this judiciary, it, it's, it needs to be apolitical. It needs to have judges who are uh, appointed for life. This was certainly a debate, right? That could, this could create a judiciary that's too powerful. Well, life tenure, it, it removes judges from, from politics. It makes them less susceptible to the, the whims and passions of of the people. So in in Federalist 70, Hamilton is arguing for a very strong executive. In 78, he's trying to put concerns to rest about how the judicial branch is uh, you know, too strong. He says, this is one we don't need to worry about. They're not going to be able to uh, take away power. They can make bad rulings, and if they do, those rulings can be annoyed. He does later in the, in the essay say we should have judicial review. He actually acknowledges that, although that doesn't come along until the case Marbury versus Madison. He had it in mind as a power the judicial branch should have. So these Federalist Papers are really important documents for us to understand, and they really help us understand what people like Alexander Hamilton had in mind when they participated in the writing of the Constitution. This should say, by the way, Federalist 78 instead of 70. 78 is this, this text here. Okay, so let's do required document, uh, letter from Birmingham jails. Very, very important document. And it's very different from the other documents that we have looked at. And uh, the difference is that it's not a document from the founding era. It's not a Federalist paper. It's not the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. This is a document from Martin Luther King. We covered it in our Civil Rights Unit. And here, Martin Luther King is writing a letter after he has been arrested in Birmingham, Alabama for participating in protests that were designed to bring about support for the civil rights movement and to get legislation passed to do, and policies changed to desegregate public facilities. And what it's about, what it demonstrates is that activism and social activism in the United States, in a democratic society, can have an impact on on the public it can also have an impact on the institutions of government and it can successfully bring about change so i have a quote here i'm not going to read the whole quote okay i would encourage you to pause and read it and uh, think about it a little bit but what he's talking is uh, talking about is that nonviolent action in the form of direct action marches and sit-ins this can cause a tension in society it can change people's minds it can force people to come to the negotiating table so that they are willing to bring about change in those power structures. And eventually, this, this uh, civil rights movement, it's not just one event, but it's a long-term long movement, different actions happen all around the country. It's going to bring about change in the legislative uh, policy of the United States. They're going to pass the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65. It's going to change public opinion. Um, it, it's going to, uh, it, you know, it's certainly an, an opportunity to demonstrate the power of the First Amendment and expression. Even though they're being arrested, they're still, you know, at, at the core value of the United States is uh, to express, uh, to assemble, to march. Uh, and these are things that they're exercising, even though their rights are being infringed and sometimes they're, they're not being permitted to do that. And it certainly can in, can change uh, the minds of the executive branch. And Lyndon Johnson and John F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy first, and Lyndon Johnson, they they end up um, kind of rallying behind the Civil Rights Bill uh, of '64 and uh, the Voting Rights Bill of '65, which comes after after other um, examples of activism. So it's a very very important example about how participation in the American political system, I guess is the word, um, it can take many different forms and change can be brought about in many different ways. So that is a little bit on the letter from Birmingham Joe and encourage you to read the whole thing.